Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our September Progressive Roundtable. I'm Andrea Miller. I'm the Executive Director of People Demanding Action, and we are going to be coming to you today live, as we do every month, from Canon 122. First of all, I'd like to thank all of our EDA and PD Action members that are out delivering letters to their members of Congress, and we are exercising our democratic duty to let our representatives know how we want them to be representing us. Today, we are going to have a very grassroots, grass tops day. There are a number of votes that are scheduled for today, all of them really, really critical. So we are expecting that our members will be voting and voting and voting again. So this will give us an opportunity to feature our partners, all those marvelous organizations that stand up with us and represent and help us represent all the progressive values that we work for so hard. Um, Mike, do you mind starting us off? Um, Mike Hirsch, our communications um, director, is going to come up and Mike is going to talk to us about the legislation in the September letter drops. So Mike, He's getting his computer already. Come on down. Thank you, everybody. Um, as our regular viewers and uh, participants in uh, Progressive Roundtable know, each month we try to come up with a unifying theme, some kind of a context to discuss the legislation that we're working on. And for September, we're going to honor our brothers and sisters in the House of Labor for all the things that they've done for us and continue to do for us. Um, too many accomplishments to list right now. So we're focusing on um, legislation to do with jobs and, and with labor. Also, uh, September marks the back to school season for many families. Uh, I know that increasingly some schools start in August, but we're going to fudge it a little bit and say uh, September is also back to school, so we're going to focus in a little bit on education as well. Um, and overhanging all of our work for the past several months has been the effort to de-escalate um, tensions in the Middle East by supporting the uh, multinational agreement with Iran to make it so Iran will never ever get a nuclear weapon. That's what the agreement says. And for some reason, a bunch of people still oppose it, claiming that the agreement's going to do the opposite of what it clearly says it's going to do. So that's another piece of legislation we've been working on to uh, defeat, to defeat the efforts to contradict the hard work that uh, the United States, the United Kingdom, China, Germany, France, Russia and uh, Iran have um, done very, to put together an amazing deal that uh, some people obviously haven't read it and heard that they don't like it, therefore they're against it. So um, what we're talking about a lot this month is uh, um, we have Congressman John Conyers who's on the PDA, Progressive Democrats of America National Board and he's one of the founding board members. Um, he sponsored H.R. 1000, which is a remarkable piece of legislation and harks back to uh, both the Humphrey Hawkins effort for full employment and even to an earlier era of the uh, New Deal. And what it would do is set up a couple trust funds, one that would help people get training to get a job or to get a better job, which is always important. And it would also set up the uh, federal government as a source of funding for projects that are necessary um, to rebuild infrastructure, schools, uh, libraries, uh, public infrastructure of all different kinds, transportation, as well as uh, home care and things like that. It, it, it would uh, basically bring our economy um, light years forward. And uh, it's, it's called the uh, 21st Century Full Employment and Training Act. And it would provide a job to every American that seeks work and create a full employment economy. Um, and uh, a similar piece of legislation that will also um, 
re-examine re and readjust the, uh, the situation in our economy is um, Keith Ellison's uh, Inclusive Prosperity Act. And it's hard to believe anybody's against inclusive prosperity, so we're hoping that if we talk to them about it, they'll sign on and co-sponsor the legislation. It's also known, it's by the nickname, the Robin Hood Tax. And what it would do is uh, assess a very tiny transaction tax or a sales tax on Wall Street speculators and use that money to fund all the needs that have uh, accumulated uh, across the country. And it would um, stabilize markets by taking the profit out of these micro trades that, that happen at the, the blink of an eye and really constitute insider trading by computers. Uh, that, that normal people can't keep up with and um, basically uh, prevent the, the bubbles like we saw um, uh, it, that, that exploded in 2008 and destroyed billions or trillions of dollars of value in the economy. Uh, and um, Senator Bernie Sanders has the companion legislation in the Senate. Um, we're also talking about um, uh, Congresswoman Frederica Wilson's um, legislation, the Student Loan Borrowers Bill of Rights Act. And uh, it turns out that people who borrow money to go to college to further their education and, and, and improve their prospects of a, having a good job uh, are at the absolute bottom when it comes to having rights to uh, discharge their, um, their debts. You can't do it through bankruptcy. Uh, and you can't escape from it even when you're retired and on Social Security. Uh, it will, um, because of the, the way the law is written today, your Social Security check when you're uh, in, in your 60s and 70s and 80s, you're still paying for this loan that you took out years and years ago. And it's highly unfair. And I even met somebody um, in Maryland whose uh, Social Security check is being drained by this, even though all he did was co-sign for his grandchild's student loan. And this is outrageous, it's ridiculous, it's another one of many assaults on Social Security, and it's another way to, that, that dampens uh, opportunity in our society and keeps qualified people from going to college. And so we're very much uh, in favor of what Congresswoman Wilson is doing. Another thing that's uh, on, the, on the, the positive side that's very exciting is um, Bernie Sanders has a, um, everybody gets to go to college for free uh, act. And uh, that's not the exact name of it, but that's the, the result of it. Um, in the past in this country, it was very affordable to go to a state college or a community college. It was, you know, very affordable for people. They could wait tables and pay for it. Now the costs of college and university, even community colleges, have become astronomical and out of reach for too many people. And Bernie Sanders has legislation that would deal with that situation. Um, we also have some other bills and legislation, but I'll, I'll wrap it up now because I'm seeing some other our great speakers are here. But I just want to give another shout out to all the people around the country who are delivering letters and do so every month. We're in three or four hundred congressional and Senate offices every month, and we're bringing new co-sponsors onto this legislation. And as far as I know, PDA is the only organization that's consistently doing this, and we hope that uh, everybody gets involved this month, next month, and we keep building this. We should be in every office every month, all the time, and with all your help, we can do that. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. And I know all our viewers out there, every month they're always looking for that new guest, that new friend of PDA that we haven't had an opportunity to meet before, but we know once we meet them officially, they're going to be a friend for life. So um, I want to bring up Mr. Robert Kramer. He is with Democracy Partners. He is also married to one of our progressive champions, Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky of Illinois. So, Bob, come on down, and I want you to address our membership, and you're gonna talk about some of the great work you worked, helped orchestrate on Iran. Okay, all right, thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's particularly a pleasure to be here on the last day of the, uh, 
Iran timetable. Um, midnight tonight, uh, attempts to stop the deal, that is the agreement, uh, will, according to the Corker bill, expire. Um, the, uh, the other side, that is Mr. McConnell in the Senate, are, is trying a last-ditch effort today uh, to get a couple of votes that uh, hopefully, in his view, will overturn uh, the votes that we've had over the last week that basically have prevented uh, consideration of this measure. As most of you know, the, uh, the original plan or the, the idea was that if, if the, uh, the deal would go into effect unless the, the Congress acted to block the President's authority to, uh, to waive sanctions, which are part of the arrangement. Um, in the, uh, the House, of course, was able to pass that, but with uh, 100 and, uh, I believe we had 162 votes uh, against, uh, that was well over the threshold of what was been necessary to override a veto. Because the President then had the ability to veto that bill, and it would then, of course, not go into effect. In the Senate, we were able to muster 42 votes and that was enough to even prevent it from being passed because of the, uh, essentially, the filibuster requirements. Um, McConnell tried another vote on Monday or Tuesday, uh, and he, we still got our 42 votes. Today, he added an amendment that said uh, that he thought would be hard for people, that said we shouldn't change sanctions while Iran refuses to recognize Israel and while Iran uh, holds American prisoners. Uh, that made people angry enough that we actually got 45 votes, including, <laughs> including uh, uh, Senator Schumer, uh, Menendez, and Cardin, who had originally voted on, on the other side. Uh, he'll make an attempt later in the day, one more time on cloture, and we'll lose with the same number. Uh, as a consequence, by midnight, we expect that the uh, agreement will go into effect. And, uh, and that is a huge plus for lots of people. And I'll, I'll say a word about the winners and losers of this battle here in a minute. The, uh, the campaign was a seamless example, I think, of, of how to get things done on the progressive side. Um, it combined a robust lobbying operation by a lot of the policy folks who really are engaged in the Iran policy questions and the questions of nuclear nonproliferation, uh, all centered around the Plowshares Fund and the, uh, uh, the Iran project, which included a lot of eminent uh, foreign policy people. It included a, an extremely active grassroots lobbying operation that was coordinated by uh, a number of organizations, Americans United for Change, that I'm consulting with. Uh, MoveOn.org uh, uh, and lots of others, and your organization participated in that as well. Um, uh, we generated over the course of a, after the, after the deal was announced, about 150,000 phone calls to Congress, of which about 50,000 we know for a fact came from the districts of the members who were, we were targeting to those members because they were done through patch through call operations that we conducted. Uh, there were, I think, a million or so signatures on petitions. There were, was, uh, were 400,000 emails sent. I mean, we had a pretty substantial uh, amount of throw weight. And a lot of people who did this kind of in the policy sphere didn't kind of understand that the throw weight mattered more often to members of Congress than a lot of these other things because their big fear was that the other side was more intense than we were. And even though they were smaller, the polling showed that we would win. Uh, that, that, you know, that we were, we were less intense and we were able to generate, I think, a sense that that was not the case. Um, during the town meetings in August, they expected to be able to really pick up steam. Move On really did coordinate a major August recess operation I think you guys participated in that allowed at all of these uh, town meetings to have us have presences very often more than the other side. Uh, all that stuff really matters to members. We did a bunch of polls that were aimed at demonstrating po that this was the high political ground. Uh, public policy polling did a lot of those, uh, presented them to members directly through the leadership, uh, and of course ran them in the press. 
By the way, let me say a word about polling. Polling, you see in the public media, seems to be, um, what shall we say, uh, indeterminate. That is, sometimes they say, oh, people are against this deal. Sometimes people say it's for it. It's all how you ask. If you were to ask, if you ask normal people, are you in favor of the Iran nuclear deal or against it? Lots of people say, well, I don't, that doesn't sound too good. Iran nuclear deal. I don't like any of those words. You know. And that's all I know. If you say, uh, you know, the, Ameri the United States recently, and, and six world powers recently negotiated an agreement with Iran that does the following, just a couple of sentences, factual, not loaded, just to tell the facts. Do you think that's a good idea or not? They say, yeah, that's a good idea. I mean, once they know what it is, they're for it. Pretty straight ahead. And uh, so all how you ask. And, um, and we had to make sure that we had a lot of polling that asked it right. Now, in addition to all the grassroots efforts, there was this marvelous cooperation with the House and Senate leadership and with the White House. Nancy Pelosi was extraordinary. I mean, she is just, I mean, she's the Babe Ruth of leaders, you know. I mean, points to the fence and hits it right over. I mean, it's just a, it's, I mean, she was relentless during the recess. I know because my wife, who was part of that whip team, was on the phone with her constantly. Uh, she was beating on me to make sure we got more phone calls in constantly. She was terrific. Dick Durbin in the Senate, who was the lead point person on that, was unbelievable, as is evidenced by the outcome. Of course, he's the best vote, vote counter in the Senate. He's the Senate whip. He, he was just great. And the president was massively engaged. And the president was a telemarketer during this period. He called all the members that he was asked to call. He really did his job of, of making it clear how important this was to him. And that was true of the other members of the administration. And the administration worked very closely, I think, with the allied groups and with the House and Senate leadership. So really good example of how everybody gets on the right side and works together. Um, let me just say one quick word about winners and losers in this. Uh, in my judgment, the biggest winner, of course, is American security and the security of children all over the world. Uh, the last thing we need is another war in the Middle East. And the net effect of a rejection would have been, I think I don't have to tell you all, uh, would have been not new sanctions and a new deal because there wasn't, that wasn't going to happen. The rest of the world community, 90 countries had endorsed this. The UN Security Council endorsed it. Our negotiating partners thought it was a fine deal. It is a fine deal. And that went, by the way, with all, all the people who knew anything about it. That is the scientists, the nuclear. We had a big, one of the other things we did was get a lot of letters. Like there was a letter that, that Rush, former Congressman Rush Holt organized, who was the, uh, now the, uh, the president of the American Association of the Academy of Science. That, did I get it right? Anyway. He organized this with all these nuclear scientists, including guy, one of the guys who invented the H-bomb, uh, who said, you know, we actually know about this. <laughs> this is a good deal. I have a good inspection proceeding, very tight. Uh, all, all sorts of amb former ambassadors, we got letters from them, uh, former, uh, uh, former national security officials. And my, I might add, in Israel, the political class was pretty much united against it because Netanyahu really whipped up opposition. but. The national security people, people who know, and the scientific community, they thought it was a very good deal and very important for them. So if we hadn't done it, we would have been isolated. Sanctions would have disappeared they would, because most of them are international. And uh, we would have had no sanctions, no deal, and uh, our only option would have been nuclear, I mean, it would have been military action. That would have been an extremely disastrous course particularly in an isolated circumstance. Now, of course, if the other side cheats substantially, we have the high political ground, the high moral ground, and the world community with us. Um, so internet, I mean, American security, Israeli security, I, I would argue, is substantially enhanced. I mean, you can argue as much as you want about how bad an actor Iran may be in the region with respect to Israel. Uh, it's a better situation having a bad actor without a nuclear weapon than with one. With one. Um, President Obama's position, I think, was substantially strengthened here. Our, the concept of multinational action was massively reinforced instead of unilateral bull in a china closet, George Bush kind of action. By the way, didn't you get a kick out of the debate last night? Jeb Bush says, 
Well, one thing you can say about my brother is he kept us safe. Ignoring 9-11 that was on his watch and the worst attack on American soil ever. What are they thinking? I mean, just, you know, anyway. Um, <laughs> astounding, really. Uh, American convening power was enhanced. Our ability to bring people together is a big power that the President of the United States has. Had we rejected this deal, it would have collapsed, not just for this situation, but for any future situation. Um, the American economy was massively advantaged because had we done what the other side wanted and reimposed sanctions without support of the other countries, we'd have basically had to exercise secondary sanctions on all these other countries that we trade with and whose economy we depend upon. Marvelous. Um, Democratic, the Democrats were massively advantaged in my personal opinion. The Republicans will try and use this as an issue on us. I think we have the high political ground and I want to tell you by election day, this will look like a really good deal because it'll be going well. Um, J Street really had its power enhanced by this deal. And the obverse is also true. The neocons were the big losers. And a particular brand of neocons that controls APAC turned out APAC is the great eyes. It uh, huffs and puffs, and when you whip, rip off the curtain, they have no ability to do anything in terms of delivering. They thought they would do it. They thought at the beginning of this battle, they believed they would prevent us from getting 34 votes in the Senate, enough to override a veto, and 142 votes in the House, enough to override a veto. That was their goal. That was the only win, that was a win, the only win they had. In the end, we prevented them from even getting a vote in the Senate with 42, and we got 162 votes in the House. <clears throat> and that was with them spending $20 million on the other side, not just APAC, but the, the neocons spent $20 million bucks on the other side. And, and part of that was because of course, they just couldn't help themselves. The last week, uh, former Vice President Cheney made a speech to the American Enterprise Institute about this whole issue, and Trump and uh, Cruz had this big event down in the Capitol One. I mean, you know, oh, that's a good way to get Democrats on our side, right? I mean, let's get the, make them the leaders of our opposition. Well, they were, in fact, of course, the same voices. That was one of the key messages we used with the same voices that got us into the war in Iraq, want to get us into this war in, uh, with Iran. Wrong then, wrong now. And just establishing lack of credibility on the other side uh, was enormously powerful with a lot of our members in the House and Senate. So uh, I think by midnight tonight, we can celebrate a real victory. I expect that they will come back at us with a bunch of secondary sanctions or attempts to sink the deal with poison pills in October. But uh, the fact that we got the margins we did, I think, make it much more likely that we can keep our troops together. The other side is clearly demoralized, as they should be. And um, uh, hopefully this will be a turning point in, in, uh, in overall perceptions of American foreign policy and, and, and overall perceptions of what is good politics in American, American, uh, the American political dialogue. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Okay. Thank you all. Did you have questions or something? Uh, yes. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yes. Yes, Bob. Uh, there is one part of this that, that uh, I have discussed with some of the, well, like Ron White, Right after he declared for this, I'm Jewish. APEC represents that it represents the views of, of Jewish people, which I am personally offended by. Yeah, we all are. Uh, I'd like you to speak to how it was that not only did all the numbers you said, but in particular, virtually all of the Jewish members of the House and the Senate voted for. Yes. Well, I mean, can you just rephrase it real quick for the mic? Sure. I mean, the, the question was, how did it turn out that all, most, most of the Jewish members of the House and Senate voted yes when APAC, which represents itself as being the voice of uh, 
you know, Jews, which is really not the case at all, they are the voice of the Israeli government in the United States in terms of grassroots. Uh, but, you know, and the answer is two things, uh, three things. One is that it turned out in the polling, and J Street did a couple of these polls of American Jews, Jewish American voters supported this deal more than the average voter. I mean, they were just, they're out of touch with most American Jews, number one. Number two, um, having J Street there to legitimate the uh, positions of most Jews in the United States was hugely helpful. I mean, uh, overtly pro-Israel but progressive organization like J Street uh, really gives credibility to our perspective and undercuts the view that the only perspective is a Netanyahu kind of view. Now, I got to tell you, I think in addition to that, Netanyahu's coming here in a, to try and undermine the deal the way he did by that speech that where he overtly coordinated with Boehner, refused to coordinate with the White House. I mean, to get along with, you know, talk about the White House. But that was a huge mistake on their part because, you know, it really unified Democrats. Uh, I think the fact that we had um, some number of Democratic uh, leaders in the Congress who were Jewish, I like my wife, Jan Schakowsky, <laughs> and, and others uh, who, were, who were leaders of this issue. On this, I mean, you know, Jan was, I think, kind of one of the two couple of leaders of the whip team having somebody who can say, look, don't talk to me about that, I'm Jewish. And by the way, uh, a fellow named Joel Pollack challenged her six years ago um, uh, from kind of the right in, in, her, in our district, in her district, um, as a candidate uh, essentially of, I mean, arguing that she wasn't tough enough in support of Israel which, of course, she really resents. Uh, but we, we beat him two to one. Now it's a Democratic district. He ran as a Republican. Uh, he subsequently became the editor of Breitbart, by the way. Uh, uh, and, uh, but, you know, they spent a lot of money. And J Street was one of the first times J Street came in and said, well, if they're going to spend a bunch of money, we are too. Uh, J Street has made the world safe for progressive Jewish uh, legislators to stand up tall on these issues politically, hugely important. So all of that would be, I think, the explanation. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, you um, said something that I hope is true, but I'm not sure it is. It comes um, November that when the Republicans try to use this against the Democrats, that um, it'll look good. And, mm -hmm. and I, I think that'd be great. But I, when I read different Democratic people who voted um, to stop the Republicans about it, to support the, uh, the treaty. Um, they always preface with Iran's a bad, bad actor, and they really benefit them quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And then they, and, and I, I think that's like arguing against, you know, what you're trying to do. I, I think it, it might come back to white people. Well, to some extent, that's, of course, just providing people cover from the attack that they're soft on uh, the Iranians. I understand that. I, I do think one of the consequences will be that, I mean, I should have put on my list of winners, the, uh, the Iranian reformers. I mean, okay. had, had the other side law uh, had won, uh, it would have strengthened our hardliners and it would have strengthened their hardliners. I mean, uh, he wanted to do something to bolster the Ayatollahs, that was a good thing to do, um, is, is to sink that deal. Um, so I think that will help because I think, I think there will be a major incentive on the part of the Iranian, the current Iranian government and, and his political base to make sure that this deal does not go south. Um, I mean, they very much want openings to the outside world and economic engagement for their own reasons that have nothing to do with us. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I think we can hope that, we certainly have to oversee the enforcement of this in a very rigorous way. I have no reason to believe that everything has been said about by the national security people about its enforceability or, is, is not true. Um, 
but I don't think we're going mean, to, the thing that could blow it up is some episode where Iran suddenly became the culpable party and somehow was using, by the way, they always say, and we're giving them a hundred billion dollars. No, no, it's their money first off. And secondly, most of it is not here in the United States. Most of it is abroad. And I mean, it's not our money to start with. We're not giving them anything. I mean, they're just getting access to their, to their resources. Um, so that could blow it up if that, and make it politically dangerous for us. I don't think, frankly, the positions that, that are being taken now by most Democrats will substantially impact that. And I do think as you see the situation develop, we're going to see more and more space to open up kind of more civil dialogue uh, with the Iranians in a, in a serious way. I mean, I, I certainly hope so. Well, I think that would be a positive. Oh, it'd be a wonderful positive thing. I mean, you know, we don't, it's a bad idea to have wars. You know, I mean, one of the things that just always struck me about a number of these guys on the other side is their un willingness to recognize that avoiding war is a political goal of the United States, or ought to be, in and of itself, because war is horrific. I mean, you know, it's not just another tool of foreign policy, right? And that's something that I think we need to say more and more. Anybody else? Okay, you're done. Okay, thank you very much. All right, well, that's obviously a guest we're going to have to get back. We've got so many speakers here. Bob, they would keep you here all day. <laughs> Take care. All right, um, I'd like to bring up again another new person for us, Linda. Um, Linda, I'm going to let you say your last name. I'm not going to persecute it from Social Security Works. I love what Linda said. Linda said, I'm your Jasmine. So, Linda. Uh, you might want to walk around because otherwise you're climbing over cords over there, as I discovered. All right. Let us know what's going on with Social Security. Um, thank you so much, Andrea. Um, I'm Linda Benish, and I'm the Communications Associate at Social Security Works, and I'm very excited to have the opportunity to speak to you all here today. Um, so I really wanted to start out by thanking PDA Action for all of your great work in August, um, organizing eight very successful Social Security birthday parties, um, which were held around the country and especially focused um, in the South, where we've been trying very hard to mobilize a lot of support for expanding Social Security, so it's really exciting. Um, and I know we're going to be building on those to continue to have a lot of great grassroots organizing for Social Security in the upcoming months, which is so important um, in a presidential election year especially. So thank you again for everyone who worked so hard to organize those. Um, so right now, um, our top legislative priority at Social Security Works is getting members of Congress to sign into House Resolution 393, um, which is sponsored by the wonderful Representative Jan Schakowsky, and it's a resolution um, expressing support for expanding Social Security. Um, and recently, um, something very exciting happened, which is that Democratic Whip Steny Hoyer signed on to the resolution. So that shows um, a lot of support from leadership and taken, uh, combined with 42 Democratic senators um, signing Representative War uh, Senator Warren's amendment um, back in March. It really shows how this has become such a mainstream democratic issue, and I've seen just in my two years at Social Security Works such a big shift, and I know how much the hard work of the people in this room and the people watching today has contributed to that, so thank you all so much again. Um, and this resolution for expanding Social Security, HR 393, currently has 71 signers, more adjoining every day, and with Representative Hoyer on, we're confident that we can get support from the vast majority of the Democrats in the House, so we highly encourage everyone to go to congress.gov, see if your member of Congress is on, and if they're not, give them a call and remind them that they don't want to be the last ones to get on board. That would be awfully embarrassing. Um, and then lastly, I also wanted to highlight a great event which is coming up soon, which is the Latinos for a Secure Retirement Conference. It will be held on Wednesday, September 30th from 11 to 3.30 in the Rayburn Building. 
um, and Social Security Works Executive Director Alex Lawson will be one of many great speakers, and as many of you know, it's always a, really a treat to see Alex, so I highly encourage everyone to go. Um, more information is available at latinosforsecureretirement.org. So that's what I've got for today, and I'm happy to answer any questions that <coughs> folks might have. Great job. Thank you. Thank you again for having me. Okay, now, have you noticed that everybody at Social Security Work seems to be under the age of 40? <laughs> all right, well, but, but I mean, I, I guess what that means is they will all be able to stay in those positions for at least 20 years. There will be a lot of consistency over there. All right, so thank you very much, Linda. Um, I'm gonna bring up Corey Hartwick next to talk about one of our bills, or actually two of the bills that are in our letter drop. Um, Representative Keith Ellison's Inclusive Prosperity Act and now Senator Bernie Sanders' Inclusive Prosperity Act. Corey from National Nurses United, an old and dear friend. Come on down, Corey. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me, and thanks everybody for showing up. Um, Mike did a great job introducing the bill, and thank you, Andrea, for bringing it up too. And we're really excited to be working with PDA on the letter drops and across the country. For those who missed the first part, this is a tax on Wall Street. It exempts small investors, it doesn't hit them but it goes toward all the things we need to work on, uh, fixing climate change mitigation and prevention, uh, education, healthcare, and best of all, it stops speculation on Wall Street, which is part of the crash in 2007 and 2008. Uh, Senator Sanders is the first to introduce it on, in the Senate, along with uh, Senator Schatz. We're up to 33 sponsors in the House, which is great progress. Uh, the thing I should have mentioned when you were discussing uh, Representative Conyers uh, full employment act is that also includes a financial transaction tax to pay for it um, We're really excited about the progress of the bill both because it offers great opportunity on the legislative front But also in organizing a lot of folks are getting out in their communities talking to people that they haven't talked to before legislative visits that include uh, I'd like to shout out food and water watch for their great participation um, both here and in California across the nation, Food and Water Watch, PDA, a lot of different groups have worked with us to build support for the bill. And uh, if solving all of our social problems and taxing Wall Street and stopping speculation weren't enough, you also get these great Robin Hood hats. Uh, which also brings me to the other important point, and that is uh, somehow politics has gotten involved with this particular issue. And uh, you may have heard Senator Sanders has been talking about it on his presidential campaign, and he's managed to raise this. Uh, maybe a year and a half ago, people thought this was a pretty fringe idea, and now it's catching on. Um, I wouldn't want to mention other folks because we are an endorser of Senator Sanders, but um, Martin O'Malley has also endorsed the bill, and I'm sure there are more coming as we move forward. Um, we've been building support. I'm happy to share with folks. Uh, you should take, oh, for those who are online, robinhoodtax.org, we have 200 endorsing organizations. Recently, the United Church of Christ's uh, Social Justice Committee has joined us, as well as Mecca, uh, a Chicano uh, youth group that does social justice activism. And all across the country, this is building up. So we're really excited about the power there. Um, I should uh, also point out, if you haven't had a chance to check out uh, hashtag RHT300 billion, we're putting these out. And uh, folks can go up and to robinhoodtax.org, print this out, and say what you'd like to do with the 300 billion. Yes, that's 300 billion with a B. This bill will raise $300 billion to go to all the social needs that we need to fill. And so with $300 billion, I'd like to have Everybody have health care in the United States. Lots of other things, too. It uh, covers a wide range of things. And that's really all I've got, because I don't want to take up all your time. I know there are a lot of speakers. If there are questions, I'm happy to answer them. What's the bill number of Sure. So it, it's slightly, the answer is a little less clear than it should be, but S1371 is the Inclusive Prosperity Act, but he's also added it as a funding mechanism to his Education for All Bill, S1373. 
So basically, call, free college education, uh, the student debt crisis is something that a lot of us are grappling with uh, from the private colleges that have deliberately exploited their students and left them with huge debt to even public institutions. Um, it, it's something that a lot of folks are finding burdensome as they move forward, and he's used it as a mechanism in his bill. And just like some, Representative Conyers has used it in a me as a mechanism in his bill to pay for full jobs for all, we think it's a great solution. A lot of times, progressives are accused of having all these great ideas, but uh, no idea how to pay for them. Well, how about if Wall Street pays for them? A lot of folks don't realize that uh, where, while you might pay a tax on your shoes or your food, uh, they don't pay anything for trading on Wall Street. And that's led to a lot of abuses and uh, them not paying their fair share. Uh, thanks for the question. Anything else? Um, we're certainly hopeful. We hear of groundswells of support within a lot of different unions, uh, and I'm not sure how much we're supposed to talk about campaigns here in the room. I raised it, so I apologize. Uh, but let me just suggest that there's a groundswell across America, uh, both within labor and elsewhere, for this particular issue. Um, and we're hopeful that uh, leaders across the country will recognize that the people think this is important and <coughs> that they should be with it as well. Thank you, Court. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. I want to bring up someone next who is going to be talking about a local activity that is coming up exactly a week from today. And everyone in this room, we are all going to have an opportunity to participate. So I want to bring up the um, at least one of the people who envisioned this so many months ago and is about to see that vision become a reality. Dr. Lisa Van Sustern of the Moral Action on Climate. Welcome. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, everybody. And thanks so much for all you do. Um, I'm delighted to be here on behalf of Moral Action for climate, and I know that I speak for millions of people, not only here, but all around the world, in the hope that we all now take action for what is this looming, well, it's not even looming, it is a crisis. A uh, little bit about Moral Action on Climate. It is an unbranded uh, network of uh, organizations and individuals. We have faith leaders from every one of the major world's religions. We have people, of course, from environmental groups, and we also have people from environmental justice justice groups. This is the first time that we're aware of a big um, rally event that brings all these stakeholders together into a big tent. We also have moms and kids. We have health care professionals. We have vets. We have students. Uh, we have all of the people who actually recognize as a cross-section of our population that urgent action is needed. <clears throat> now, you know, there's always a tension between putting your foot down and demanding what reality requires. And for that, the purists of the world will say, we've got to do this, we've got to demand that, and we will have our day and we'll be strident and all the rest. And on the other end of the spectrum is a rather anemic presentation that uh, suggests that this is all just a celebratory event on the mall for fun. We like to think that we are somewhere very much in the middle. And the reason is that our primary goal is really bringing in new people to this conversation. So yes, we're preaching to the choir, we're galvanizing the masses, but we're looking at other people, people who might be on the writer end of the spectrum politically. Uh, there are many Catholics who have been um, uh, unaware, unresponsive to the issues of climate justice. Um, we also realize that there are many other um, groups for whom some of the wording, when you talk about centigrade and carbon emissions and all the rest, tune out. So another one of our messages is that we are looking at being good stewards of this planet, that we realize that what we do here today will have an impact on the future. So we have very carefully crafted something that we think both appeals to those who have something in their gut to say reasonably to the realities, 
as well as open arms to those who may want to hear a slightly different message. So in um, quoting one of my good friends, Reverend Lawrence Jennings, we believe this is the right place, the right time, and the right message with the Pope coming to Washington, D.C. on September 24 to address our elected officials that we together in response to one of the most amazingly courageous thought leaders that any of us will ever have the lucky chance to be with, as well as a moral force that he can bring in this disparate group because of the estimation with which so many people hold this amazing individual. So our event there on the Mall, uh, we want you to come and we want you to make your um, voices heard. We want you to know this is a respectful event. Um, it is an event that is at its root hoping to reach the American people. So, and as any good Democrat, I will say that, and quite reasonably, irrespective of any political affiliation, is that we need people in office in 2016 especially who are not going to stand in the way of legislation and policy that makes our planet safe. So we invite everyone to come into this discussion to elect leaders who are going to choose their representatives very carefully. Thank you very much. Yes. Yes. September 24 on the uh, National Mall, Washington, D.C., go to our website, thank you for reminding me, Moral Action on Climate. You will dot org. Dot org, sorry, moralactiononclimate.org. You will see dozens of partners that we're very, very honored uh, to be working with, including PDA, and the Earth Day Network, which knows a thing or two about putting on big events on the mall. So you will see somebody that you um, can recognize, an organization that you feel a particular affiliation with, I'm sure, and I hope that that draws you. Yes? Uh, you still didn't say where on the wall the Sorry, between 3rd and 7th Streets, I guess. <laughs> between 3rd and 7th Streets, right next to the Capitol. Um, it is uh, just uh, um, uh, outside of next to a paid area where um, the speaker's office will be offering ticketed spots. These are um, exclusive spots that essentially um, uh, are keeping the, anybody but those specially selected people out. In fact, um, there will be a fence that's erected between them and the people on the mall, we believe who most represent the ideals and the values of this pope. So we are there um, as representatives, we are the people speaking up, uh, and it is uh, free and open to all. At, at this is, well, I guess I keep fudging on that or don't hear the question because we have changed the start time many times. Yeah, I'm really not getting that. Um, because the Pope's schedule has changed so often, so the fluidity of that, um, and the reason I keep not hearing the question, is, is because of that. His timing has changed. We still don't know for sure what time he starts. We could be starting as early as 7, but I think that's highly unlikely because I think it's still going to be dark. So I would guess if you're there by 7.30, there's your answer, um, that you will uh, be in good shape. But please do go back to moralactiononclimate.org to get the latest updates on time. Now, just so that you have an idea, there will be a front section where we will have, before the Pope speaks, a number of faith leaders and others who are very dynamic speakers, plus exciting musical events. We know that people want to feel excited and happy and, um, and uh, energized. Then we have six jumbotrons there. Those will bring in live feed from inside the Congress so that we can see and hear uh, the Pope. And uh, then we will, after that, have a sort of a celebratory event, that celebratory event of the Pope's message urging us to take action to protect our common home, um, will involve um, not only the 
people that are the energizing speakers and musicians, but it will really be looking at where do we go with this? Because it's not just a one day affair. We are not presuming to uh, start a movement. We are preserving to ex proposing to expand a movement so that all people who know that climate change is a moral issue are now front and center in this discussion. So by the future, I mean the lead up to Paris, and the uh, hearts and minds of all Americans as they go into an election period, and especially on 2016, on that day uh, when we go to the polls, that people are mindful and that this is a litmus test. Who is going to look out for our common home, for life on the planet as we have known it? And that should really dictate who they vote for. So, thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, while we're talking about our common home, Emily, um, can you talk to us about what's going on with Protect Our Public Lands Act or POPLA? Come on down, Emily. It has been far too long. Actually, it's Liz, because Emily couldn't oh, make oh. it. <laughs> That's OK. Oh, you're caught this way, otherwise you're fine. She wanted to be here, but she's there's a cold going around the office that we all are getting over. Yeah. So <laughs> I know, exactly. Um, I'll keep this really short. I just wanted to thank PDA and our other allies for continuing to support and spread the message that we need to keep our fossil fuels in the ground and a good vehicle nationally to go around to your members of Congress and representatives to use to spread that message is H.R. 1902, which is the Protect Your, Our Public Lands Act of 2015. It was introduced this past Earth Day by Representative Pocan and Representative Schakowsky, <laughs> who we've talked a lot about today. Um, and currently, we have 25 co-sponsors, including Representative Pocan and Schakowsky. We are urging folks to reach out to their other members to get more members of Congress on the bill. We think 25 is great, but we really feel like we should be getting more. Um, also, we are asking folks to reach out to their member in the Senate side to try to get a Senate person to champion this bill on the Senate side. Um, I also just want to highlight a quick um, event that we are doing, we are helping with, that will be Monday. So this Monday, September 21st at noon, on, um, we're going to have a screening of Groundswell Rising, a little clip of this documentary that shows stories of people living near local fracking sites. Um, we're doing this for Hill staffers, so if people can reach out to their members and see if they can have someone from their office attend, we think that's a great educational opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, All right, another great friend of PDA. Mr. Mark Dudzik, who has worked with PDA and our founder, Tim Carpenter. We know him from the labor campaign for single payer. I know him from work also that we did on uh, Representative Conyers' jobs for all bill. Mark, come on down, please. Thank you, Andrea, and it's great to be here. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, hearing Mike Hirsch's uh, opening on uh, this being uh, Labor Month and focusing on jobs, now I understand why Andrea asked me to uh, talk about uh, single payer as a job creator. So I was a little perplexed about why that was going to be the topic this month, but uh, now I understand. So, and it, it actually comes, it comes at a good time because we just recently saw the uh, revival of the discredited theories of voodoo economics uh, with uh, Jeb Bush coming out with his new, uh, new old tax cut plan and the whole theory that by uh, 
uh, cutting taxes and shifting more wealth to uh, the top 1% that somehow you're going to have this trickle-down uh, economic stimulus program that's going to create jobs and uh, economic security for, for most Americans. I mean, this theory has been bouncing around uh, for 35 years now, at least, since the, uh, since the Ronald Reagan years, and it's, it's shown to be a complete fraud from start to finish. And, uh, you know, the fact that that's all that these folks can come up with is really, um, really uh, telling in terms of what uh, the issues are going to be in the uh, upcoming election season. But there is an economic theory that, uh, that has a lot of credence and that has been proven to, to work. And that's a, the theory uh, that uh, in the real world, when uh, you uh, engage in economic activity and you use public spending as a spark to economic activity, that that creates a stimulus and has an actual multiplier effect uh, throughout the economy to move things forward. Uh, you know, so that the typical uh, model for that theory is sort of investment in infrastructure uh, projects. So uh, if uh, the, we took public money and invested it in a rail system, uh, not only would they, that provide employment to the people who would lay the rails and design the system and everything, it would uh, provide employment to people who manufacture the steel and all the other equipments, assuming that that's done in the United States, which gets to another trade issue, but we won't go there today. Uh, and then it also provides employment uh, on the secondary level to the, the person who runs the delicatessen, uh, where the workers go before they uh, go into work to get their coffee, and the people where uh, the bar where they cash their paycheck, and the stores where they buy their school clothes, all of these, uh, these other activities that surround it. It's a multiplier effect. Well, single payer uh, really even more so than infrastructure projects, single payer can, can have that effect because not only does it utilize public uh, spending in a way that really mobilizes and uh, uh, puts people to work around a social good, but it also frees working class, uh, middle class Americans from these unnecessary and wasteful expenses that they have to put uh, towards health care and the requirement to save money in unproductive ways to pay for catastrophic health care coverage. So uh, instead of giving money to a bunch of rich people who men, maybe will buy a yacht or two but then s sit on that money in bank accounts or offshore it or do whatever they do, you're putting more money in the hands of working class Americans who are then going to spend that money at the local grocery store and uh, um, in, in their own communities for, for productive things. Now this was really borne out by a 2009 study uh, by the Institute uh, for Health and Socioeconomic Policy. The study was commissioned by the California Nurses Association and it was titled uh, Single Payer and Economic Stimulus Plan for the Nation. Uh, and it does a real detailed analysis of all of these multiplier and stimulus effects that a single payer, national single payer plan similar to what HR 676 would establish uh, really does a detailed study of that and it came up with a conservative estimate that a, a national single payer plan would create 2.6 million new jobs in America. Uh, over what uh, would normally be ex expected and that those folks would pay an extra $44 billion in taxes at the state and, uh, and federal level. So, you know, it has this massive uh, stimulative effect. So it is a job creator and it's very important to remember that. Now, there will, of course, be significant displacement in a transition to a single payer of administrative employees and uh, health insurance uh, company workers uh, who are doing all the kind of wasteful duplicative uh, work that uh, makes our healthcare system so complex. Every doctor in America has at least one employee whose sole job it is to argue with insurance companies about the proper reimbursement for services. Every insurance company has at least one worker whose sole job it is to argue with that worker about how much they're gonna, <laughs> gonna pay back. So there's this huge uh, uh, wasteful infrastructure that will be eliminated. And we in the Labor Campaign for Single Payer have always insisted that there be a just transition 
uh, program to transition those workers into productive uh, employment. And that's going to require real money and a real social commitment. When you engage in a broad social reform that affects the livelihoods of working class Americans, I think we have a uh, duty and an obligation to provide uh, uh, transitional support for uh, the, those people who would be affected in those changes. There is so much capacity uh, in as we transition from this wasteful system that wastes 30 percent of every health care dollar to a single payer system to provide those benefits that uh, you know we need to always keep that in mind as we uh, as we uh, move forward so uh, you know it's important if we're talking about uh, jobs and labor issues this month to remember that single payer is part of the solution. Uh, it, it would help to stimulate the economy. Single payer would help solve a lot of the uh, uh, budget crises that are uh, driving austerity politics uh, uh, at the state, national, and local levels. Uh, it would help save the U.S. Postal Service. It would eliminate a single payer system, would eliminate the uh, uh, budget deficit in the Postal Service. Um, and, uh, you know, eliminate the necessity to shut post offices and uh, 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 lay off postal workers as a response to that, uh, to that deficit. So uh, it's important to, uh, to remember that. There's some other interesting developments that have uh, been going on over the summer on the health care justice front. Uh, first of all, the la labor support for single payer continues to grow uh, and really uh, has been an, uh, it's become part of the mainstream vision uh, within the labor movement now. It's uh, uh, finally kind of come back uh, into, the, uh, into focus. I think uh, there's a couple of developments that really brought that home to us. Uh, first of all, in New York State, uh, the State Assembly passed a uh, single-payer bill. Uh, it's now f up in the, uh, in the State Senate, and you know, there's a long process before it, it moves forward. But the reason that that bill came out of the Assembly, there's been a single-payer bill in New York for over 20 years. The reason it came out of the Assembly is a number of large, influential unions in New York State uh, really committed substantial resources and organizing capacity to make sure that that bill moved forward. And that's a sea change in a strategic state. Uh, and we've seen that around the country. Um, likewise, uh, at the end of July, the uh, Executive Council of the AFL-CIO met. That is the, the largest labor federation in the United States. Uh, and uh, among other things, uh, the council spent a lot of time talking about the sort of crises that workers are facing right now. Among other things, they voted to um, make sure that their new program called Raising Wages, which is their sort of mobilization program for the next uh, period of time, that that incorporates Medicare for all messaging in that program as part of the organizing. So we really have kind of broken through on those issues. I think there's two decision this spring, making it clear that Obamacare is the law of the land, and uh, despite the fantasies of the Tea Party right that uh, you know it's not going to be overturned, uh, has has opened up the ability to uh, think about where we go next instead of having to the, the urgency to circle the wagons around uh, you know uh, reform that was partial at best. You know, now, you know, people are free to think about where we can go next without thinking that they're betraying past, past accomplishments. And secondly, uh, we're five years into the Affordable Care Act, and we're dealing with um, both some of its positive consequences, but also some of its negative consequences. And they have some real uh, impact on the future of employment provided health care benefits, uh, the biggest issue that's, that labor and uh, uh, everybody will really be facing is an uh, uh, excise tax that's uh, derogatorily called the Cadillac tax, although we call it the Chevy tax uh, because it's going to tax bread and butter health care benefits that working Americans have struggled to uh, establish and maintain over the years. This tax is going to take effect in 2018, and it's, it's a lot of technical information on it that I've don't really want to get into now, but it's really impacting how employers um, uh, are looking at the future of health care benefits through uh, employment-based systems and causing a lot of ferment at the bargaining table. And that, that's waking up a lot of people in the labor movement to realize that if we don't finish the job, fight on to health care justice, 
and establish health care for all that, uh, you know, that our ability to continue to uh, negotiate decent benefits for our members is, is going to be uh, eliminated. So uh, we have a, uh, a lot of things going on uh, at that front. Uh, we're coming together the end of October in Chicago for a National Single Payer Strategy Conference. Uh, this is going to be the first joint conference of the, some of the key organizations in the single payer movement. My organization will be joining together with Healthcare Now, a group called One Payer States. Uh, uh, National Nurses United is going to do a major mobilization around the conference. Uh, and we will be joined by uh, Physicians for National Health Program who will be holding their annual weekend the same meeting and will have a number of common events. So I'd urge people, this is going to be a very exciting strategic conference at a, at a crucial moment in the, uh, in the uh, movement for health care justice. So I would urge you to consider coming to Chicago October 30th to November 1st at the Chicago Hilton. Uh, you can get registration information at laborforsinglepayer.org. So uh, if there's no other questions, I would turn it back to Andrea and thank her for uh, PDA's uh, lawn and principled support for this, this issue. Thank you. And I'm going to take this opportunity to give a shout out to our own Dr. Bill Honigman, who will be attending that conference in Chicago. So wonderful, wonderful, wonderful Dr. Bill. Um, I want to bring up another very, very, very dear friend of PDA. I don't think we've ever had the opportunity of hearing Dr. Harvey Fernbach speak at one of these. So I am very, very delighted to bring up an old friend, someone that we see at every event that we hold here in the Maryland DC area, somebody that is always there for us, who has always been a tremendous support Quarter, so I want to thank him officially and bring him up. And instead of having us talk at him, we're going to have him talk to us. Dr. Harvey, come on down. Harvey. Well, you know, uh, thank you very much. It's uh, very good to be here and that you're having this uh, meetings uh, every month and. I was very glad to hear Mark uh, Dudzik bring us up to date on the, what's happening in single payer. Uh, you know, as, as, I'm, as you know, I'm for, with Physicians for National Health Program. And for me, as I was sitting there and, and anticipating uh, coming here, I, I realized just this is a, it's a, it's a wonderful year for single payer, improved Medicare for all. To think about having a, a Democratic uh, candidate for president interviewing introducing single payer, to have a so-called a, a Republican uh, not, uh, backtracking on single payer, to hear it in the national media is really a, a step forward. I mean, I, I have to assume that there are people out there saying, what is a single payer, whether people are promoting it or denying it, maybe I should Google it, learn more about it, improve Medicare for all. Uh, we certainly couldn't have afforded such publicity if we went out to buy it. <laughs> um, and whether it's pro or, or con, uh, uh, it's really an advance, because I've been with uh, Physicians for National Health Pro Program for 25 years, and uh, I remember in, in 1993 with McDermott's H.R. 1200 single pay bill, and may you rest in peace, uh, McDermott's uh, bill in the, uh, excuse me, Wellstone's bill in the Senate, uh, you really had to tell people what this is all about. And uh, uh, so we really come a long way, you know, in, in, in activists, uh, things don't happen, you know, on one big day and you've accomplished it or, you know, and, and then on to the next thing uh, for a few more weeks of, of uh, advancing. So it's been a long process, but it is for me a headline to see it in the national media and hopefully our various organizations around the country will be able to uh, make use of it being in the uh, presidential uh, dialogue and, um, and maybe go to some of the rallies to 
you know, advance single payer, for example, a Sanders rally to not so not not to necessarily not to promote Sanders, but to promote uh, single payer at those rallies, which will naturally have people who are uh, very likely to support us. So again, I thank you uh, for having this. It's great uh, uh, to be here. Take care. We were hoping that Representative Grahalva would be able to join us today, um, and he is not. But one of the things that I know a number of people probably saw yesterday was an email, if you're a member of the Stop Global Warming issue team, asking you to endorse um, the clean energy green job resolution that Representative Grijalva is going to introduce. So for our PDA PD action members that are not members of this team, this is a resolution that people on the PDA action board worked on and we were able, working with our friends at the JAMA Network, get introduced into Congress. So what I want to do now is let you know basically what is in that resolution for everyone who did not get a chance to see it yesterday. Um, this resolution supports shifting the energy supply strategy of the United States from coal, oil, natural gas, and other fossil fuels to 100% clean renewable energy, including solar, wind, geothermal, and other clean renewable energy sources, and to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions by January 1st, 2050, along with increased energy efficiency and conservation to end dependence on fossil fuels percent of electricity to be derived from renewable sources by January 1st, 2030. Number three, establish policies and programs to modernize the national infrastructure for the 21st century transition toward full employment with millions of new green jobs and build a sustainable economy. Number four, provide educational and job training programs, transitional financial assistance and job opportunities for coal miners and other fossil fuel industry workers displaced due to the transition to a renewable energy-based economy. Number five, provide retraining and reemployment for green jobs for military veterans, including those returning from military service in Iraq and Afghanistan. Number six, provide increased funding for educational training and job assistance program for rural residents and for increased emergency preparation and assistance to damaged rural communities due to the adverse impacts of climate change. Number seven, help the people of the United States to establish resiliency to withstand significant impacts of climate change that are already occurring and that are expected to accelerate in years ahead. Number eight, establish policies that capture and store carbon by protecting forests, improving land and agricultural practices, including carbon farming and planting and greening of urban landscapes. Number nine, I'm almost done. Support trade policies to maintain American labor and environmental standards and through tax incentives promote the growth of jobs in the United States, including manufacturing jobs, for the purpose of achieving full employment and protecting the environment. Number 10, phase out all subsidies for fossil fuels. And number 11, that's the last one, establish a national goal doubling efficiency of existing buildings from 2015 levels by January 1, 2030, 
and support a policy of the United States to work with the United Nations and other international organizations and nations to significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions to avoid catastrophic impacts from global climate change and set a national and global goal to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions by January 1, 2050 by replacing fossil fuels with 100% renewable energy along with conservation and energy efficiency. So we are very pleased and very delighted to have been a part of the creation of a piece of legislation that its goals are to accomplish all those things. Um, we were expecting some other guests. Um, Reverend Sadler contacted me this morning. He is still in Charlotte, and unfortunately, he is sick. So he was not able to make the journey. And our wonderful folks from PD Action in Alabama, their last day in Washington, D.C. was yesterday. They have already returned to Alabama. So we're not going to be able to get their update on Don Siegelman. So what I'm going to do is I will have them join us for the end mass criminalization call on Thursday, October 8th, and we'll get their update that way. So our last guest is Steve Schaff, a member of the board of People Demanding Action, the, um, a member of the Emeritus Board of Progressive Democrats of America, someone who has been with PDA for a very long time. He has been a very big supporter. He's going to talk about jobs from the small business perspective. Too often when we talk about jobs and think about jobs, we're thinking about them from the big business perspective. And then he's also going to be making some announcements about some pretty exciting things that are going to be going on with people demanding action. So Steve, come on up. All right, thank you very much, uh, Andrea. I, uh, I'm very happy to be here today and uh, quite proud to have been involved with PDA since pretty much the uh, very beginning. Uh, it's a wonderful organization and uh, frankly, I think the best is yet to come, in my opinion, uh, because of the great work that's gone on over all these years as well as all the things that are beginning to come together. And if you listen to what was being discussed today, there was this theme that kept floating in and out, at least in my mind anyway, and that was coming together. In other words, we're all beginning to figure out ways that we can start connecting and working towards common goals. So what Mark was saying about some of his work with labor, uh, we, we hooked up with him years ago. We realized, hey, labor, a progressive movement on our side coming together, uh, working tenaciously on single pair with very minimal compromising and strong convictions to maintain our principles is how we need to do this. In other words, converging our voices. So today uh, I wanted to uh, talk about a couple of things, how People Debating in Action, PBA, and some other organizations need to come together to really strengthen what we already are building. Uh, I'm proud to say that uh, one example of uh, something good that's going to be coming up is a wonderful celebration that we will be having in October here in D.C., October 21st specifically, and it will be our first annual and inaugural Tim Carper Onward Award Celebration. Those of you who didn't know Tim, he had some very interesting phrase words that are sort of part of our PDA lingo now. Teamwork was one thing that always comes to mind, but Onward was always something that not, not only did he, he verbally put out there, but he, he did in his day-to-day -day actions. And because of that, we all felt the same, same need and desire to work just as hard as he was in terms of moving things onward, despite the obstacles in our way. So the purpose of the onward, the first onward celebration, is to not only honor the memory of Tim Carpenter, whose work we are still building on and whose work still 
still continues despite our losing him last year. We're going to be honoring those that helped start and support and make PDA successful. And I think that list is so long that we definitely will have to have an, an annual event because we can't possibly honor all these people in one place. And frankly, the uh, third part is to honor the fact that PDA, despite losing someone as dynamic, tenacious, inexhaustible, and uh, charismatic as Tim Carpenter, that the health, the state, and the foundation that he has helped build is not going away. It's getting stronger and bigger. And by that I mean not only are we doing greater things and creating stronger coalitions and getting involved with a wonderful campaign that rose up seemingly from nowhere but we knew it was out there, the Bernie Sanders campaign. We're going to honor the fact that we are expanding as an organization by finally creating that C4 we've been talking about over the years and we all know that C4 as people demanding action which is something that Andrea has been working on and building out and doing an excellent job and uh, getting so much done literally within our first year of, of being organized. So there's three things we're going to be doing, honoring his memory, honoring those that helped uh, PDA get off the ground and uh, gain the momentum that we have, and, and finally, honor the fact that we are stronger than ever, we're doing more, and we've got two sister organizations now that combine to do even more, uh, uh, have even a greater impact. So PDA action which is all I could to talk about a little bit today. People Demanding Action was really came out of kind of the need for PDA to get beyond just the electoral politics and to more formally exert our strength. Over the years, we realized that PDA on the Hill outside was one of the few organizations that was able to sort of work well with a lot of different groups. But like the civil rights, uh, unlike the civil rights movement, we were all out there, but we weren't coming together and really realizing that we have to consolidate our voice. So a big function of people demanding action, aside from supporting and, and collaborating with our electoral work with people uh, with uh, Progressive Democrats of America, is to help facilitate, accelerate, and bring these sectors together. This year, for example, uh, Lisa uh, talked about the, uh, the rally that's going on next week. Now, here's a tremendous opportunity, and she met us formally. We've known her before because she's run for Congress in Maryland, very good progressive. We, we met in our first leadership conference back in May, and she was talking about doing this rally, and she wanted to get our help. And we thought, okay, right, uh, well, we'll check you out. The rally was to bring people, faith-based people, to the mall, while Pope Francis was here. And as you know, when the Pope comes to town, man, the place shuts down and a crowd comes out. So we thought, okay, great, uh, you know, what do you have going? And we realized that they were just starting out. So long story short, within a few months, with PDA, uh, People Demanding Action and, and other, other co uh, collaborators, we've come together and we've got this little, little, good, little idea that in the spring was an idea evolving into what should be a very fascinating and large statement that we need to have, particularly when we have someone like a, a Pope Francis in town. So that's an example of one of several different things that People Demanding Action is already involved with. Earlier we, we'd heard and got acknowledgments and thanks from our, our friends at Social Security Works that we helped organize several birthday parties because People Demanding Action has an ability to organize, to have a field presence to work with PDA to have a monthly roundtable like this, to do letter drops to literally hundreds of Congress offices inside and outside the uh, district or, or the Beltway. And a bunch of other things that between PDA and people demanding action, we're equipped to do. So we are already, with minimal resources, because we're just starting out, making a big impact. We're building stronger relationships and coalitions with faith-based, labor, environmental, social, and economic justice uh, uh, organizations, and a few others. But there's one sector that I've been advocating for that's got to be much more involved with the mix that isn't quite here yet. And you've heard me maybe in, in the past roundtables talk about this. But the one sector that I've been passionate about, because I started out as a business person, a social uh, entrepreneur, my background is affordable housing development here in inner city DC 
and organizing and political activism all simultaneously done together. And you might have heard about this great recession we had. Well, as an affordable housing uh, inner city developer, even in D.C., let's just say I had an early retirement, at least from that, that perspective. But I always approached social change with economics. If you could show the conventional business world that you could make change and profitably do so without necessarily poisoning, destroying, and stepping on people, then I think we've got a much better world. And by the way, you probably make more money than the way you're doing things now. So I'm a social entrepreneur. I'm an idealist, but I'm a realist. I'm a business person, but I'm an activist, and I'm a political strategist through my work with Progressive Democrats of America, which I'm very, very proud to be associated with. So I, you know, had this early, I won't call it retirement, but let's say an extended vacation from my real passion, community redevelopment. I want to I literally rebuild the inner city. In America, we should not have, you know, slums in inner city. So I had time to really think and figure out, okay, what can I do? And I realized what I could do best is really work within several different sectors business, political, organizing, a whole bunch of other stuff. So a couple years ago, uh, a great national organization that is relatively young, like PDA, uh, the American Sustainable Business Council, came up to me and said, hey, we've been hearing some good things about you. Let's work together, so on, et cetera. I thought, hey, all right, great, a national business organization who, in my mind, was the counter to the Chamber of Commerce, or as I like to refer it, though it does piss off some of my friends, the Chamber of Profits at any cost. Here's a national organization, American Sustainable Business Council, wanting to be the alternative to the power of the Chamber of Commerce. So I thought, great, let me work with you. And like a lot of sort of progressive organizations, they did not have all the resources they needed, but they said, hey, look, can you go and set up a, a Maryland you know, affiliate uh, to, to uh, work with us? And I said, well, all right, great. So you want me to start up a whole new organization and with no resources, this, that, and the other? Well, you think I'm crazy? And they said yes. And I said, well, you're right. So here's what I'm going to do. So a couple of years ago, at the beginning of last year, 2014, we organized the, well, it was not the Maryland Chess, uh, 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 Business Sustainable Council, but the Chesapeake, because my argument was in our capital region, we're really an environmental, ecological, uh, and, and frankly, a, a cultural community that transcends the line. So you have Virginia, D.C., and Maryland. So we created the Chesapeake Sustainable Business Council. And the goal was to really bring businesses to the table. So last year I spoke around, um, at the round table, and my point was that just about every major problem we have in the world, as a matter of fact, I would argue that all of our problems are because of big business and status quo. It's really their fault, whether it be rigging the financial system, creating a tax system that can park all our profits overseas, cheating the rest of the country out, out of resources, pushing pollution industrial complex that they know is, is destroying the earth, squashing alternative solutions that they know work, at least they work in Europe and other countries that show that renewable energy is really you know, doable and profitable and uh, here for the future. Uh, whether it be they are flaming warmongering for the sake of protecting profits or creating profits. Think about that. War is profitable. Or whether it be they are buying up our political system. If anyone wants to argue with me out there or in the room that I'm maybe exaggerating this, that could be a discussion we could, we could have for the next couple days. So big business to me is really the root. My concern is what I said the last time I spoke uh, last year was to counter that, we have the best of passion, passionate activists, faith-based folks, labor, and others, some business people coming together to fight that. That's a fight we're not going to win. And my point was big business, status quo business may be the problem. My point is that businesses must and can be the solution. So what I'm calling the smart new economy business movement, I think, is a sector that not only has to be built out, which it is, it's beginning to be built out through the efforts of the ASBC, CSBC. 
not only have, that has had to be built out, but that they must come into our umbrella or into our fold as a collaborator with what not only people demanding action is doing, but a lot of other initiatives, including our friends with labor and, and so on, et cetera. In other words, business has got to join the fight. They've got to find a, a place they can come in and join the fight. And we have to make sure that businesses realize that they too are being completely screwed and hosed by the status quo because your most your businesses are small. Your most small businesses pay many more taxes, at least in Maryland, than that big, big energy company I just referred to in the DC area or major hotels that are based in, in Maryland. They pay zero, like GE does for years. So the whole idea here is businesses have to wake up and realize that they've got to really start understanding that labor is a friend, that activism is a friend, the green economy is not something to be shied with, away from, and if this is all done correctly, you can actually increase their bottom line and make them more profitable, which is really what businesses are trying to do. So the idea of uh, founding the CSBC was to build out this with the idea that if we create a good model, then we can go to ASBC and say, hey, can, let's take this model to other, other states. While we're doing that, we've got people demanding action, building out a whole national activist coalition. How about if we marry the two or, or, or merge the two to some extent so that we could really ex accelerate th this kind of uh, collaboration? So with that in mind, let me give you three quick examples of what CSBC has been able to do that kind of illustrate this point. The first one is, is something that uh, is very interesting and a real anomaly. Uh, a major energy company based out of Chicago that's very well known for its uh, deep uh, investments in nuclear energy and for coming into and buying up other energy companies and also, if not overtly, very covertly suppressing anything that has to do with building out the renewable uh, uh, energy systems that are emerging. Exelon came to D.C., wanted to buy D.C., merged D.C. into their empire. It was a multi-billion dollar deal, and they needed to go through the whole process of commissions and so on, et cetera. In this case, it was D.C., Maryland, even parts of Delaware and Virginia. So it was a pretty complicated process. So uh, as we were going through the whole process, uh, there was hearings and so on, et cetera, and CSBC would go and testify as a business organization to be against this merger. People were like, w uh, what? And one, who are you? And two, wh what are you talking about? So we stood out like a sore thumb. And our points were, look, this is a bad deal. It's bad for consumers. It's bad for businesses. It's bad for the environment. It's bad for the development of the future energy systems that we have no choice but to invest in. And by the way, the typical freebies and the and the, and the techniques that they use to throw out to community groups, the little ch charitable donations and things like that, were just completely uh, against our best interests. So we thought it was a bad deal. We stood up as a business organization. We gained notoriety. We'd like to gain even more notoriety the next time we go through this process. And lo and behold, much to the shock and amazement of everyone, including the activists, a few weeks ago the DC Commission turned it down. A multi-billion dollar energy merger turned down, we all fell off our chairs. We just did not expect it. Problem though is they had like a 30-day sort of uh, re redo, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but they have an ability to sort of overturn that and unfortunately, uh, or today, uh, our uh, other friends were literally down at what we call the Wilson Center, which is our city hall in DC to make sure that the, count, uh, the commission doesn't change their mind. They have, I think, another week to, to change their mind. So hopefully, if this is not the case, uh, that we as an organization, small voice, were able to say, hey, we, we as a business group stood up and said this is a bad deal, period. Okay? So that's an example of what business, more and more business groups need to do. A second example is, and this is sort of what People Demanding Action is doing, is look, we're out here. We're, there's a lot of groups wanting to, to get involved, but we're not connecting. So one of our biggest priorities, and we've talked to a number of organizations over the last year and a half or so, is look, there's hundreds of organizations around the D.C. metro area, whether you be academic, policy, businesses, uh, uh, activists, environmentalists, labor. We all have the same agenda, we are all working towards the same uh, 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 priorities, but we don't talk to each other, we don't know each other, and therefore we have a completely dysfunctional 
way of moving things forward and our voice is muted and almost uh, weak, completely weakened. So how do we bring players together? We could have round tables, we could talk about how we should get together, which we certainly did last year, and we are now going from round tables to things like tomorrow where we're bringing four, over 40 serious change agents and thought leaders who are at some of these round tables to not talk anymore, but to talk in terms of what do we do next and how do we bring these coalitions and alliances together so the next time an Exelon comes into town, we're ready. We have a strong argument. We have a louder voice, and our political friends, or shall we say political elected officials that were subsidized maybe by you know, other folks, will have a harder time to believe the, uh, and be intoxicated by the small little <coughs> tchotchkes that they throw at us in order to win these big, huge victories, which were worth billions of dollars to them. Another example, a third one, final one, is a little more universal, but also sort of illustrates how people demanding action is sort of has their tentacles and, th and is, uh, threads their influence all throughout. Uh, one of our uh, national allies, uh, an organization that was founded by Mike Lux, uh, one of the associates of uh, Bob Kramer, who was here earlier, uh, is doing a similar conference this coming uh, at the end of the month. 75 major national business leaders and thought leaders, social uh, uh, responsible uh, business people are, are coming into one room for an entire day to do something similar that we're doing on the regional level. So CSBC has been asked to help facilitate that. The reason why this all came about and it's all connected is because of the relationship that, that, that uh, People Demanding Action had with Mike and, and his group. So here's a deal again where we have this coming together. A business group, a national organization, and conventional or not conventional socially responsible businesses that never were organizers or thought of themselves as organizers coming to DC on their own expense to talk about how we could really accelerate this change. So to be there's some really really good things that are going on not only in building out the business world but what PDA people demanding action can do. So Let me sum up with, uh, leave you with three major points, okay? And thank you for listening. I figured we had a little extra time, so I'd take my time. Because these are very important points, okay? One, a very important point is a smart new economy business. What I mean by new economy, businesses that want to build out the 20, we're using 21st sensibilities versus going back to 1950s uh, mentality. A smart new economy business movement must grow and play a greater role, have a seat at the table, encountering the status quo business system that is dominating almost everything we're doing. Two, people demanding action must play and can play, and I'm afraid I think is best poised to play a major role in building these bridges with business and all the other sectors we've talked about. Okay? And thirdly, so we've got business, we've got people demanding action and activists, and thirdly, frankly, and this goes to you out in the audience, is you, you've got to get more involved. You've got to be part of this, this growing movement. You've got to encourage business to know that, hey, this something's going on. You've got to put more pressure on our elected officials. You need to show up to some of these letter drops that we're doing literally by the hundreds that are beginning to resonate throughout Capitol Hill not only with our elected officials, but with other groups, hearing that for almost two years now, PDA has been dropping off and being in, in, in anywhere from two to 400 congressional offices a month. Even major labor's like, hey, that's something we haven't really been able to do, okay? So the point is, you need to be part of the solutions too. In other words, all of us need to come together. So, the first thing you could do in that regard, of course, is to if you're in DC, come join us next month at a wonderful celebration. It'll be a great uh, gathering of very good people in that room. If you can't make it, we're looking to do a simulcast with our, our friends and associates and supporters at uh, Social Security Works and We Act Radio. So if you can't make it, you could do sort of a, you know, a phone-in contribution uh, or just get involved with any other activism that's going on in the community as people demanding action expands throughout the year. There'll be more uh, streamlined and easier ways for you to get involved and encourage your friends, folks, uh, your faith-based uh, community to get involved. So let's work together. It's going to be a very good year. I'm really proud of the fact that despite Tim not being with us anymore, 
that PDA has earned tremendous credibility and tenacity uh, and credit over the being, still being here, let alone growing. And I think uh, what we could do, given you, uh, uh, cultivating more resources over the next uh, uh, three to six months, which is a big priority for us, the year 2016 should be a very productive one for us. And this is all without saying what's going on with uh, our friend over uh, in the uh, Senate who's running for president, who at the very least, who at the very least is bringing up all the issues in a much more amplified way than I think even we were all hoping for. So between that, between what we're doing here, 2016 could be an absolutely outstanding year. So let's all come together, really work hard, and let's make sure business is part of this whole process. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you, Andrew, for the great work you're doing. Mark has got a question. Oh, okay. Right. Uh, remember, every newspaper pretty much has a business section. I don't know if too many will have a labor section. <laughs> and uh, that's unfortunate, but if we get progressive this message out to the uh, business uh, side, I think we'll advance both sides very, very well. Right, right. Well, you know, we have an issue here where the, you know, the, the uh, establishment really knows they're being threatened. Why? Not because well, all of a sudden we're going to swell up and uh, get our pitchforks out, but because the economics are definitely in our favor. There's no question that continuing uh, investing in earth-destroying world and all the costs that are becoming more and more clear day to day, even in mainstream media, is not a path to go. So they're eventually going to have to do that. Big corporation come in and say, yeah, you're right, Harvey. Let's change the medical system or, or let's uh, reinforce uh, the, the road towards single payer. Uh, very, I don't think you're going to get that because the, the group think and the way the corporation work. The way it's going to have to happen is you're going to have to have a, whole, a lot of education amongst everyone and say, you know what, buying locally not only supports every, uh, you know, my local uh, uh, pharmacist, but the earth and a whole bunch of other things. It's not until you start really educating and, and putting it out there or, or doing civics courses in school again so people can realize, oh, uh, yeah, we have elections and we actually have a say in what we're doing, or get the uh, minority activism out there and give them hope in order to come out and say we could change elections and turn this whole country upside down if we raise the the, the uh, voting rates in the inner cities by five ten percent or whatever the case may be there's so many things we could do but we aren't because you know we're not taught to do that so it's going to take a lot of real grassroots deep on the ground kind of convergence and a collective understanding of how the dots are connecting why? Why should I care about labor when I talk to my business associates? I say, here's why, because labor needs us and vice versa. And we have more in common with labor than all the rhetoric and propaganda you hear with labor, you know, destroying the country and all the other stuff. When they hear that, they say, what are you talking about? And I always say, well, did you pay more money in taxes last year than <clears throat> the big area uh, uh, hotel? And they're like, what are you talking about? I say, well, you know, this company for years has never paid a dime because there's a tax loophole. Did you pay any tax money? Oh, of course I did, you know. Well, there you go. So big business is hurting you, too. You're a business person. Labor is saying, hey, we, we need more people working so they can spend more money at your place. So that's, and then people look at me like, oh, I just thought you were a radical. I said, no, no, this is a practical, you know, approach here. Plus, I want my, you know, next generation to, to know that they'll have the ability to have a next generation, too, which unfortunately is no longer hyperbole. As scary as that is, even mainstream people are saying, yeah, we, we, we have some problems here. Dan? Uh, yeah. Uh, when I was working for Santa Perra out in Sonoma and Murray County, um, there was an effort to go to the, uh, was it the Rotary Club and those kind of business organizations. Um, and I, I, actually, I didn't um, do well with them. Um, I let other people do that. <laughs> 
Well, we have to reach out to everyone. The American Sustainable Business Council is sort of is modeled as a as an association, and what they do is they work with associations that are, are that have number of members. So collectively throughout the country, they represent enough associations that represent well over 200,000 small, sustainable, even some larger businesses. And the idea is they want to advocate, they want to help organize, uh, they want to really point out that a business does have solutions, businesses can still make money, and if we sort of modify our way of doing it, then everyone could be happy. Uh, so they started out, I found out about them because one, we're tenacious organizers here, and uh, two, uh, I had been searching for years, what's the alternative to the Chamber of Commerce? I'm a business person, and I, the only thing I can go to when I want to go to business organizations is the Chamber of Commerce. It's the only time I would get highs is I'd go into these rooms and think, <laughs> I mean, I could work with and relate to anyone, which is what we should, rotary clubs or whatnot, but I just knew that you know, by their whole nature, they were really buying in and supporting very destructive things, particularly how they've been lobbying over the last 10, 15 years. I mean, talk about just unbelievable disregard for the realities of what they've been pushing for. So, but good question, and unfortunately, we need to work with everyone. And I found, too, that even my most hardcore right-wing right, right -wing friends are always amazed when I say, you know, I, actually, you're right, because, you know, there's plenty of Democrats and leftists that are really stupid, to be honest with you. I'm like, what? It's like, yeah, <laughs> you, most of you guys are stupid, but hey, you don't get what you want unless there's enough of us over here doing this. You'd be amazed at how many arguments I've stopped with that. Uh, what? <laughs> it's like, yeah. Now, how do we collectively get what we all want with compromise? Because it's too, you know, I want everything, or, or even on the left. We've, PDA's biggest problem when we started out, we had a lot of absolute pro uh, progressives. That when we couldn't get 100%, and this is what I loved about Tim, Tim would start, can we get 50? And they could get 70% of what we want, and 80, and then finally what we want. He was very good at that, which got the respect of a lot of people here on the, ho the hill, particularly those that weren't hardcore progressives. In the beginning, he spent a lot of, literally the first few years, fighting off some of our most passionate supporters, but those that were absolute leftists, okay? And that's something that as a mature organization, we've sort of uh, shed that reputation, and therefore the mainstream folks and a few people that were in this room today, for example, would never have been here in the beginning, that are coming here because they feel that you know, we're astute and how we're reaching out, and we're principled in terms of really respecting the dialogue on all sides. What I really love, and Andrew and I started talking about this years ago, is frankly, Progressive Democrats of America was your pre pretty typical aging, hippie, middle class, somewhat male-dominated organization. And she and I were like antsy, it's how do we expand this? My work, I've lived and worked in, in, in communities uh, of color and still do almost my entire life. And I'd look around this room and think, well, first of all, I'm, I'm like, it was my 40s, and I'm kind of the youngest person here, that was strange. And second of all, I get uncomfortable in all white rooms, to be honest with you, and that was a big problem with me because I live and work in these communities. So one of the things I really applaud and it, it happened immediately was people demanding action was able to reach out and bring in very quickly, not only a coalition, but tremendous leaders. And when we started reaching out beyond our usual folks that we work with, they all realized that yes, like the civil rights movement, and there's a few key leaders that managed to bring all the players together. Because the civil rights movement, you know, started really in the 30s until King and Parks and, and a few other major players, and even some white folks. When they all started realizing this is a human issue, not just a black issue, all of a sudden that happened. And I've talked with enough people and Andrew over the last year and said, are, do, are, are we strong enough, or do we, are, is we express, ex displaying too much hubris by saying maybe we could bring it together? And one, their thought was, one, you've been doing a pretty good job of it already, and two, no one is doing it. So here's little, little bitty old people demanding action, poised to really bring us together, and the other side rarely has to worry about a group like us. They will, especially when they start hearing and feeling the movement more, when we have more resources and more people joining board, coming on board, and we certainly have that happening on the political front with Bernie. Bernie's not fringe anymore. Isn't that pretty cool? <laughs> so, any other questions? Bernie's on time, cover oh. time. How about that? Before Tim had passed, he approached Bernie and said, Bernie, we really needed to run for uh, president. 
it's got to be symbolic. You could probably help start a political movement. And then the issue became, well, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. The issue with debate was whether he would run as a Democrat <laughs> or an independent. And one of the last things that I think Tim really contributed, and Tim, despite his, his uh, uh, illness throughout the years, was tenacious. He worked at the very end. I think perhaps one of his parting gifts to us was pushing Bernie not only into a campaign, but a campaign that I think even surprised the rest was that has sparked at the very least a dialogue that is no longer sequestered to in these time or nation readers. The whole country, despite the mainstream trying not to do this, is hearing and seeing this guy, even students at Liberty University. Can you imagine that? I don't know if you heard that speech. But there are students at Liberty University saying, huh? This is, we never heard this before. It was very interesting. He handled it very well. So anyway, let's take that momentum and keep building on 2016 because frankly, we have no choice. We have four or five years, 2020, if the state elections go the way 2010 did, oh man, you know, we're, we're going to be in for it. So we're going to be pretty busy the next few years. So everyone, tune in <laughs> October 21st, spread the word and get the support going. Any other questions? All right, Andrea. I'll, let, I'll leave you for a few more minutes. And All right, thank you. All righty. Um, do we have any announcements? Stephen, come on up. You're climbing. Oh, no, come around. Yeah, come around. Yes, I just wanted to state that the end corporate rule issue organizing team call has been moved from next Wednesday to September 30th Eastern time at uh, 9 p.m. on September 30th. And uh, that was because Yom Kippur is not over on the West Coast where we have lots of participants by the time of the usual call. So we've moved it to September 30th at 9 p.m. And I also totally agree with uh, what Steve Schaff was saying that the whole reason the end corporate rule issue organizing team started and has come together is the realization that big business is the problem with respect to all of our issues. And then unless we took them on head on, then, you know, we, the single issues, each of the other issues, wouldn't be as powerful. So that is really important. And even, I welcome anybody, uh, whether you've been on a prior call or not, we talk about all the issues surrounding corporate control, including the Constitutional Amendment to overturn Citizens United, including the Grand Alliance to save the Postal Service from privatization, and many other issues. <laughs> Thanks. All right, thank you, Stephen. Do we have any other announcements? Mike Hirsch, come on down. Thank you, Andrea. Um, also on uh, uh, September 30th uh, in the evening, uh, uh, that Wednesday, um, here in uh, the D.C. area over uh, across the, the Beltway in Maryland, we're going to be having a congressional forum on the environment for all the candidates who are running in D Maryland's District 8, and that's to, rep to, uh, to um, replace uh, Congressman Chris Van Hollen, who's running for Senate against uh, Don Edwards. And um, it's gonna start at seven, go till about nine. It's gonna be at one Veterans Plaza in Silver Spring. And we've got confirmation from almost all of the many candidates who are running in that, um, in that election. And we also have uh, co-sponsors like uh, the Sierra Club and uh, um, various other organizations are working with us on that. Well, in wrapping up, I want to say thank you to everybody that has watched our September Roundtable. Another thank you to all the activists who delivered a letter to their member of Congress. We will be back next month. The Roundtable will be on October 21st. So we will have it live streamed as always. It will be on pdamerica.org. And I also want to thank 
all of our grassroots organizations, our grass top leaders who joined us today to make our September round table another very special round table. So good afternoon and thank you. Yes.